So what we want to talk about tonight is unity and growth and how they go together. And we want to begin by, by first of all, just thinking about, first of all, thinking about what we've covered. We've covered, in terms of living in the last days, we've covered the family, we've covered materialism, and tonight we want to look at the ecclesia. So what can we expect in the ecclesia and what should we be looking to do in the ecclesia in the last days? Well, the first thing that we need to think about is the ecclesia. And the thing that we need to think about primarily is the ecclesia is God's design. Now, last Sunday morning, a brother exhorted at our meeting and he was his opening words were something like this. The ecclesia is a bunch of odd bods which are all brought together by the power of God's word. And we've got to work with that and do the best we can to the glory of God. Now, I thought that was a good statement. The ecclesia is a bunch of odd bods brought together by the power of God's word and we need to work in that framework to the glory of God. And that's pretty true. God's design is in the ecclesia. Note this quotation first, first of Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13. For the body is one and have many members, and all members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptised into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made all to drink into one spirit. Now, Paul couldn't have made it any clearer, could he, by the use of one. It's all about being one, being together. And if the ecclesia is God's design as it is, then all believers, that is us, have to come to the point where we can put differences aside. We need to come to the point where we're mature enough in Christ to be bound together into one fellowship in our one baptism into one body and feel that we are one. Looking at this arrangement humanly, from a human point of view, we would think it wouldn't work, but it does. But it does. And what it's likely to do, it's likely to lead to some problems and difficulties from time to time, but it is God's design and it's a training ground to bring us to the kingdom. Ecclesial life was never intended to be perfect. First century ecclesia was not perfect. There were problems in the first century. If there are problems in the first century under the guidance of the Spirit, we can be assured that we're going to have problems in the last days. So when we think about the Ecclesia, brethren and sisters, what we've got in the Ecclesia is Yahweh's Ecclesia and it's a living unity amid diversity. So we've got unity, though we are, quite diverse one from another. What we've got to do, fundamentally, particularly in these last days, are two things. One thing is that we've got to encourage each member of this ecclesia to grow into the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't matter how long us as individuals have been in the truth. We are still growing into Christ. We're growing into the head. Now, what we have the great privilege of doing is helping each other grow into the head. Now, that's both a great privilege and a huge responsibility to provide the circumstances where people want to grow into Christ. And we can encourage our brethren and sisters to do that. The second thing that the Ecclesia has a responsibility of doing is helping others who haven't found the truth yet to come into God's truth. 
And if we're not unified and growing into Christ ourselves, it's not likely that we're going to be bringing others in. So we need to be aware that we've got those two very important things to do, to help each other now grow and also to provide for people outside the opportunity to be exposed to God's truth. Now, the opening verses of that chapter that our brother kindly read for us this morning, that the, the, this evening, is a fantastic verse. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. Now that's pretty much all we really want to talk about tonight. It's pretty much all we want to talk about tonight. Now let me give you an alternative translation of that, which, which is a bit closer to the original Greek. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to live lives worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all loneliness and meekness and long-suffering, enduring one another in love. Now that word enduring there, in the Greek it means to bear lovingly, to bear lovingly and to make allowances for. So if we are enduring one another in agape love, then what we'll be doing is we'll be bearing each other lovingly and making allowances for differences that we see in one another. Making every effort, verse 3, to preserve the unity imparted by the Spirit by means of the bond consisting in Peace, or as another Greek scholar says, the uniting bond of peace. Now, when we've got ecclesial peace, harmony and unity and love and growth will develop. And that all comes with each one of us taking our individual responsibilities to help each other grow into Christ. What a great privilege it is to help each other grow into Christ. Now in the process of that, of becoming one, in the process of that, becoming one in Christ, our personal initiative or, and our individual expressions are not to be crushed. God does not want that every one of us are identical clones of each other. He wants us to be in Christ as who we are and refining who we are into the image of Christ. And we will take our individual, individual initiatives and our individual expression into Christ. Now, look at verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he, hath, wherefore he saith, when he hath ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Quoting from the psalm as we know. And then look at verse 12. In verse 12 we read, uh, or verse 11, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, there it is again, edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statute of the fullness of Christ. So there's what Paul wants. There's what God wants. There's what Christ wants in us that we all come together like that. It's not a matter of stifling your personality. It's not a matter of saying, oh, I won't suggest anything because it may not be appropriate. Initiatives are important in the truth. But it's about growing together. And ecclesial oneness is, is not, brethren and sisters, an end in itself. You know, we're not a club. 
We're not. I used to be uh, once in the Masonic Lodge when I was younger, about 18 or so, and, and my father uh, got me in early because he was a worshipful past master or something, and I went, and that was a club. It was like a social club. Yes, they did some good works at times, and they helped charities, but there was no real unity like we've got in the Ecclesia. It was more of a club, and when you walked out of that place, you became an individual again and had really nothing to do with that group of people. We're not like that in the truth. It's quite different in the truth. So ecclesial oneness is not superficial. It's not something that's just merely near the surface, but it's a desire to be one or a desire to be one just for togetherness sake. It's not about that. Ecclesial unity has a vital purpose, and that vital purpose is of being a blessing to one another. And God's provided that, that we can be a blessing for each other. Have you ever thought about that? That we can be a blessing to each other. And in being a blessing to each other, the ecclesia is gradually built up. It is unified and can thus be a blessing to those who are not yet in the ecclesia. So there's our two roles, to help each other now and to invite others to join us in God's truth. Now, as we said, verse 12 there indicates that there's a work to be done for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. So it's a progression. We're not there. But it's a progression. We've got to move into that. So there's a work to be done. And in order to carry out that work, brethren and sisters, and all the tasks assigned, believers have got to cooperate with each other. Without cooperation, we can't share that inner growth of the ecclesia together. And that inner growth of the ecclesia growing in Christ is a blessing one to another. So if a brother or sister takes it upon themselves to do something within the ecclesia, to provide for an individual or a group of people or even the whole ecclesia in some way, that is the privilege of a blessing to the ecclesia from someone in the ecclesia. And look at verse 14, because that points out something extremely important, and I'll read it from, an, from another translation. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and whirled around by every gust of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by their talent for deceitful scheming. Now, in the last days, brethren and sisters, we are under attack from all kinds of people and ideas. And we must be very careful that we are very doctrinally sound and that we encourage each other for sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. Not to be taken away with every gust of doctrine by the trickery of men. So we've got to be aware. And it's clear the emphasis in this section is both growth and unity. Not, of course, concerned with numeric growth. It's not about numeric growth, but it's growth into Christ's likeness. Now, when we see that in the Ecclesia, we know that things are starting to work well. And with that, unity and growth will work together. Verse 15 says, But adhering to the truth in love, that you may grow up in all things into him, who is the head, even Christ, from whom the entire body harmoniously fitted together and held together by every supporting joint according to the energy that corresponds to the capacity of each individual part. You see what the Greek's telling us? Each individual part's got to work together. And that's where our capacity comes from, brethren and sisters, from each individual part, and brings about bodily growth with a view to its own upbuilding in love. Now, that's a tall order for us, brethren and sisters, but what a thing for us to aim for. So all things considered in that couple of verses of Ephesians chapter 4, 
it's clear that deep unity, which is amongst or amid adversity of the ecclesia, and growth in Christ supply the key to this whole section of scripture. That's what Paul is talking about. And he encourages us all to making every effort to preserve the unity imparted by the Spirit. See, our unity is from God. It's imparted by the... How is that done? Because as we read the scriptures and get the principles and practice from the scriptures and we all start to do it together, it unifies us. That's where it comes from. So that's why Paul says, making every effort to preserve the unity imparted by the Spirit by means of the bond consisting in peace. Verse 3. Now, Weymouth has a, an interesting touch on that. He says, earnestly striving to maintain in the unity of the bonds of peace, the unity by the Spirit. Pretty good, and I like his work. Excellent translation. So where are the keys to growth and unity? Well, they're right here in these verses, and you've got them right here. No doubt about it, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. Now, if we took that little verse and said we're going to use that as our guide in the last days to keep our ecclesia growing into Christ and being unified, that wouldn't be a bad thing. So let's tease that out a little bit and think about what Paul is talking to there. Now, first of all, he says that one of the keys to unity and growth is that you walk worthy of your vocation wherein you are called, how, Paul? With all lowliness. Now, lowliness, interesting word, old-fashioned word, but really means modesty, humility, because we've been taken out of darkness and brought into the abundant light of the truth, who among us could brag about that? No one. Where would we be if we'd never been brought into Yahweh's truth? That in itself ought to humble us. That in itself ought to humble us. Every day we are the recipients of incredible grace, forgiveness, mercy, hope and purpose. So every morning when we get up, we've got all those things from God. We've got a purpose in life. We've got a hope in life. We've got forgiveness every day. We've got mercy and grace and hope working in our lives every day. Take that away, brethren, sisters and young people, and where would we be? I'll tell you where we'd be, on the scrap heap. Because without those things operating our lives, we wouldn't be humble. And our humility is gauged in our approach in lowliness, modesty and humility of life. So it's not about prancing around the ecclesial world as if we're self-made. It's a gift of God. And we're pilgrims, brethren and sisters, and we're strangers in this world. Pilgrims and strangers. And I'll just refer you back to that verse, verse 2. Just please note, with all lowliness. How important that word is. And you know that word's there in the Greek. Sometimes you think it's not there, but it is. It is there in the Greek. With all lowliness. It's a little word, but it's got a magnificent significance. Moffat offers us with perfect Modesty, which is not too bad, with perfect modesty. So with all loneliness or with perfect modesty. The quality of meekness is seen in a brother or sister, and we've all seen them in, in operation in the ecclesia, who either do not or are slow to insist on their rights. That's all lowliness in operation. That's never going to cause friction in the ecclesia. It's perfect modesty in the, in the translation of Moffat. 
That, that brother and sister has come to the realisation that there is no rights per se. We have no rights per se. All our rights were secured by God's grace. And any rights we have, brethren and sisters, are in Christ Jesus. And then he adds this beautiful word, with all lowliness and meekness. Now you'd think, well, lowliness, maybe that is meekness, but it's not. It's the character of gentleness. So let's take the brother and sister again who demonstrate this, and there they are in the ecclesia, you can see them over there. What are they like? Well, they would rather take wrong than inflict it on someone else. That's pretty hard for a human being, isn't it? Pretty hard for us not to get on our dig, so to speak, but to take wrong rather than inflict it. Um, let's go to Corinthians, 1st of Corinthians, chapter 6. And verse 7. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 7. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud that, and that's emphatic in the Greek, that your brethren. So there's an ex extreme example of someone demanding their rights. They've taken a brother or sister to the law courts, which is no part of our life. Extreme example, yes, but it happened. But in meekness, it wouldn't have happened. Take the, take the example of Abraham, who in great meekness of spirit preferred Lot to have the first choice. You often see younger children cutting up a, a, a chocolate or something to divide with their siblings. And, you know, before they learn these principles, it's about a three-quarter quarter job. Three quarters for them and a quarter for the sibling. Uh, and then through life, they learn that, you know, cut it in half or maybe a third and two-thirds to the sibling. And that's the same principle that's coming out here. Long-suffering is the next thing that he talks about. So long-suffering, what is long-suffering? Well, it's patient endurance and perseverance, yes, but while under pressure. So it's pretty easy to be patient. Well, not easy. You can learn to be patient through the scriptures, and to persevere, but not under pressure. Because as soon as pressure comes on us, brethren and sisters, we run for the safety zone, the comfort zone. And the comfort zone is the way we normally do things. So we've got to learn that under pressure, we've got to be long-suffering, or if you like, long-tempered. We all know what short-tempered is. Long-tempered is being very slow to come to anger. Now, there's a Hebrew equivalent to this word in the Old Testament, and it's actually used in Proverbs 19. And a very interesting quotation is. So let's turn there, Proverbs 19. Where you get a, a, an equivalent in the Hebrew, you're on pretty safe ground to be able to say that there's a nice expositional point here that we can, that we can draw out. So in uh, Proverbs 19 and verse 11, we read this. The discretion of a man deferreth his anger and it is to his glory to pass over a transgression. So this Hebrew word is arak, A-R-A-K. 
And here, it's the idea of discretion. It's the discretion of a man to be long-suffering and to defer his anger. Now, you imagine the impact of that on the Hebrew civilization, and now we take that into our times, into the New Testament and into our times, and the same principle is there. Long-suffering, the quality of self-restraint in the face of provocation. No hasty retaliations. They're the things that cause us real problems. And if you're taking the odd note, you might want to write Exodus 34, 6 down because you'll know that it also occurs there when it speaks about God. You imagine, brethren and sisters, if we can go back to, um, to Ephesians chapter 4, and when we're going back there, just think about the first century ecclesia. Think about what it was like to come out of the Gentiles or out of the Jewish community and become a Christadelphian in the first century. This virtue of long suffering, of self-restraint in the face of provocation, would have been so much required at that time. Because the first century Christadelphians were often misunderstood, treated harshly and cruelly. And you know, in First Peter, well, don't turn it up, First Peter 3 and verse 10, Peter uses this word, he says, the long suffering of God waited. Isn't that beautiful? The long suffering of God waited. Then Paul goes on in Ephesians and talks about that we need to with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring by that to keep the unity of the spirit in the bonds of in the bond of peace. Forbearing one another in love. Now, what does that mean? How do we forbear one another in love? Well, that characteristic of a brother and sister who can and will. Endure injury and take no notice of it. In other words, it's a classic turn-the-other-cheek situation. That's enduring one another, and not only enduring, but doing it in love. Because you love your truth and you love your brother and sister. And you know, that, that Greek word, it's, it's basic. The basic word that they stem that Greek word out of, forbearing there, the idea of forbearing, the, the basis of that word is not shaken up. So this is talking about someone who is very steady, forbearing one another in love, steadily, steadily forbearing one another in love, enduring injury and taking no notice of it for the ecclesia's sake. That's also got an Old Testament equivalent. And the Old Testament equivalent is the word AFQ, A-P-H-A-Q. And it means to contain, to abstain, to hold on to, and to be strong. I'll say that again. It means to contain, to abstain, to hold on to, to be strong. And if you're taking a note, 1 Samuel 3.12, and of course Isaiah 42.14, it is used there of Yahweh. And that's the character that God wants to see in his children. This ability to forbear one another in love, who can endure injury and take no notice of it because of love's sake, because of the benefit of the ecclesia, not wanting our own way. That's the idea of that word. And then he adds something really important. He says, endeavouring, making every effort, giving absolute diligence, doing your uttermost, says the Greek, doing your uttermost, endeavouring to keep the unity of the spirit. 
So that word endeavouring there means to make every effort, to giving diligence to, to doing your absolute uttermost. And brethren and sisters, I don't have to tell you, that's the responsibility of every one of us in our clusias. And I'm not saying that, the Bible is. That's the responsibility of every one of us. And that unity is promoted by peace. When there's peace in the ecclesia and harmony and a good spirit in the ecclesia, there's unity. Where there's strife, where there's contention, there is disunity. And there's no growth into Christ and there's no development where there's that problem. So this exhortation from Paul that addresses living in hope and in unity is followed, of course, by a classic description of this unity in verses 4 to 6. There is one body, one spirit, even if it's been called in the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So it's really, brethren and sisters, a really important issue. So let's take that now a little step further, having dealt a bit with Ephesians and just summarising that. The, cre the, the keys to growth in Christ and unity in the ecclesia are lowliness, modesty and humility, meekness or gentleness, long-suffering, patience under pressure and long-tempered. Now, we see unity in Christ in our ecclesial world. Those of us who have had the privilege of travelling a little bit, maybe on mission work or something, have seen enormous amounts of unity when you walk into a, an ecclesia for the first time with people you've never seen before and all of a sudden you feel part of it. That's an incredible... That, that comes from the scriptures. That's not a fluke. That comes from the scriptures because all the minds are going to the one place. They're all thinking the same way. Now, we see it among our young ones. We see it around the world. And we've got to try and get that unity in Christ operating continually in our meetings. Not haphazardly, continually in our meetings. Now, that might take a bit of work. Just remember, for bearing one another in love, enduring injury without taking notice of it, to contain oneself, making every effort to preserve the unity imparted by the Spirit, bearing up lovingly and making allowances for each other, not demanding your rights. You have no rights per se. So let's move to the work of the Ecclesia. Well, the work of the Ecclesia is that we are the salt of the earth. Now, take the Ecclesia out of society and imagine how much worse the general society would be. I don't think we appreciate, brethren and sisters, sometimes how much influence the word can have on neighbours, workmates, schoolmates, all sorts of people that we're in contact with. If we were taken out of the earth, and we will be, it's going to be gross darkness. So we are, the work of the Ecclesia is to be the salt of the earth. It's also a city set on a hill that people can see. You know, when people look at us, they should say, wow, that, uh, that person is really happy in life. They seem to have a purpose in life. They seem to be happy every day when they get up. They're rejoicing. They go to all the... I see them going out. You know, they go out Sunday morning. They've got flowers. They've got big bags and suit coats. And they come back and they have lunch. And then they're off again with another bag. And, oh, what are they doing? We've got no idea. But they're very happy people. Now, that is, brothers and sisters, being a city set on a hill and a light in a dark place. The ecclesia of the living God is a preserver, salt, a beacon for the gospel set on the hill and a model of order and government on the moral and secure basis. We're a light, brothers and sisters, in a very dark world. The churches are so corrupt 
There's no light there and there's no light in the secular world. There is only the Christadelphians that can bring some light to this world. So as we work in the Ecclesia, what are our foundations? Well, our foundations are the breaking of bread, of fellowship in each other, of supporting each other, of comforting each other, of showing kindness and mercy to each other, of exhortation and encouragement in Bible study and in preaching the gospel of God. So if we looked at our foundation work, that's about it. I might have forgotten one or two things, but that's, that's about it. The breaking of bread, the memorial meeting, our fellowship around that, our support, comfort and kindness to each other and to every man as we can, exhortation, Bible study, preaching the gospel of God. So in the, in the five or six minutes we've got left tonight, we just want to start to tease out each of those things. So let's take first the breaking of bread. Each Sunday, Sunday by Sunday by Sunday, do this in remembrance of me. Every Sunday we break bread. And in breaking off that common loaf, a piece, we see and appreciate our association with the Lord Jesus Christ. We break in symbol our bodies with his. So we're aligning ourselves with him, bringing into subjection our thoughts and our actions to him. In other words, growing into Christ. Growing into Christ. Sunday by Sunday. And then we take the wine. And we sip the wine and so partake of a symbol of his sacrifice for sin. It's a time of remembrance, personal, private and deep. It's between God, the Lord Jesus Christ and you. What an amazing moment that can be in the life of a saint when we partake of bread and wine quietly together in fellowship and in unity and growing into Christ. What a remarkable pair of, of symbols the Lord Jesus Christ and his Father have given us. Bread and wine. Now, because we do that every Sunday morning, the act of this communion with Christ must never become stale or seemingly meaningless or repetitious. I'm sure it doesn't, and I'm sure none of us would allow that to happen. But we've got to be aware that it can happen. So when we come along Sunday morning, every Sunday morning should not cause a repetitious sameness but a closeness, more intimate experience with all the repeating. So every time we come along to that memorial meeting and we bow our head for the prayers, for the bread and the wine, and then we partake of the bread and the wine in that order, every time we do that, it should bring us closer and closer in that more intimate experience that God has provided for us in his son. A brother once told me, very long time ago, if you come to that meeting in the right frame of mind, it's probably the closest you're ever going to get to your heavenly father. I think he's right. And I know that we can get close to God whenever we choose, and we should choose often to do that. But on that particular occasion in this foundation meeting that we have, it's an opportunity. And with each occasion we become more aware of God's grace and the holy things which we have espoused, brethren and sisters, together, in unity, in growth, together, growing into the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, in that quiet moment over the bread and over the wine, the real us is discovered, 
or uncovered, if you like. You can't hide anything in that situation. Kay's got on our mantelpiece piece, a little sign that says, you can't hide anything from God. It's a great reminder for all of us. You can't hide anything from God. And in that memorial meeting, in that moment, in that quietness, our real individual is uncovered. We compare ourselves to Christ and we thank God immediately for his forgiveness because in reality, we're miles off being like Christ. We're trying, but we've got so many foibles and problems that we're not there. But God is so merciful that because of the faith, he forgives us for Christ's sake. And our hearts and minds are totally exposed to God's mercy at that point. There's no other way out. That's what we've got. And we appreciate, though I think sometimes dimly, the love of God in giving his son for us. What an incredible thing that he gave his son for us. That's amazing. And the more you think about it, the more you think to yourself, this provides me an answer for what life is really all about. It gives me an opportunity, that memorial meeting, to feel my need for renewal, to be absolutely positive to start this new week much better than I did last week, full well knowing that I'm going to make my mistakes during this new week. But I'm going to pray God that I'm growing into Christ a bit more every week. And that memorial meeting gives me a tremendous opportunity for a need that we all have to be uplifted. You know, we sang that first hymn tonight, very uplifting hymn. And in the memorial meeting, after the exhortation, after the time we've taken to meditate upon the bread and the wine, you often hear that memorial hymn sung very loudly, very meaningfully, because it's impressed all of us, brethren and sisters, and it's uplifted us for the next week. You know, without that, we'd be in terrible trouble. So the breaking of bread provides us a need for an answer. It provides the deep need in us to find answers to everything. Our minds are designed to think in terms of why, how and what. And if we went through life not knowing the truth, there'd be a lot of whys, a lot of hows and a lot of whats that we've never been able to answer. But we can answer them in Christ. We understand it. We know what God is doing. And our minds designed like that keep saying, why, how, what? And these simple emblems focus our minds on our Father, whose purpose fills heaven and earth, an earth created with a marvellous purpose. Marvellous purpose. God's going to fill this earth with his glory. And it'll go far beyond that, brethren and sisters, because after the millennium we don't know, do we? But the scope is gigantic. And we're sitting here as mortals. One day we're going to be confronted with immortality. That is, that we're never going to die through God's grace. And the openings that provides are gigantic. And I sometimes sit in my study and exercise my mind Though I'm not a very strong mind to exercise, but I exercise my mind on what might be after the millennium. And I think about eternal life and immortality and how that opens so many options for God to use his saints to do a lot of things, not only on this planet, but probably right through the universe and beyond. That's stunning. So we need to think about that purpose. And we need to remember, finally, brethren and sisters, for tonight, our need for renewal. 
So every Sunday morning, in the quietness of the memorial meeting, we receive new vigour, new drive, new vitality, renewal. And in our minds, we redetermine to follow our Lord. We are very conscious in those moments of God's forgiving grace. What a wonderful thing. And when we've got unity in the Ecclesia, brothers and sisters, and when we've got growth in the Ecclesia, growth into Christ, not numerically, but growth into Christ, and unity in the Ecclesia, we'll appreciate that love and grace and mercy far much more because we'll see it in each other. We'll see it in operation in each other. And finally, we fall from grace, not just because we're human, but because we're weak and sometimes lazy and sometimes forgetful, and can I add one, sometimes stupid. And these symbols speak of moral qualities made special by his willing sacrifice. This calls us to effort on his behalf. He's done so much for us, the Lord Jesus Christ. So now it calls us for effort on his behalf to overcome, to improve, to be like him. We shall be like him, says our hymn. Oh, how great the promise. So, brothers and sisters, let's leave that for tonight and we'll continue on in a couple of weeks' time. And we'll look at other issues in the Ecclesia. But at least tonight, I think, we've been able to, uh, through Paul's words uh, in Ephesians, been able to build a bit of a, a block for us to work off from our next class. Thank you.